Hi, I'm Cameron Skader, online editor for Epigram Comment, and this is the second episode in our series, Collaboration with UVTV, where we're going to be debating Brexit, the most important political decision of our time. We've got James and Rob, and they'll be doing a very, very interesting and thoughtful and respectful debate on the key issue of our time. So, James, what did you vote, and why did you vote it? Well, I voted Remain. Um, Sort of 18 months ago, and I voted Remain. I think you know, for the vast majority, the most uh, young people who voted Remain. I saw yeah. Europe as our future. Um, so sort of as the world gets more expansive and sort of globalised, it's I think it's much better for Britain to be a part of a uh, something bigger, so we can impact uh, the world sort of more effectively through that. I think the European Union has proven to make it safer. It uh, keeps us safe economically. It keeps us safe um, from crime, it keeps us safe from all these other things, all quite safer than we would otherwise be sort of independently and outside of the EU. Hello, my name's James, I'm 22, I'm from Milton Keynes and I do a Masters in Public Policy. I'm debating for Remain and that we should stop Brexit. My main reason behind this is that for young people it's going to be absolutely disastrous. Uh, we didn't vote for this. We overwhelmingly told um, the government that we don't want Brexit of any kind and for them to then go on and negotiate possibly the hardest and most destructive Brexit possible, I think is a is an outrage and a betrayal of what the young people of this country um, wanted for their future. And Rob, what did you vote and why did you vote it? So uh, I voted Leave, uh, which I know isn't very popular. Um, uh, I voted Leave because I don't think that the future direction of the European Union uh, to become a kind of United States of Europe, uh, a federal Europe, is the kind of thing that would be good for our country. I think it's really important that we cooperate with Europe on issues of security. Uh, on matters of policing. But on the wider issues, I think it's better that we can ensure that our own parliament is responsible for our laws, to ensure that we elect the people who make those laws, which ultimately gives greater confidence in the democratic systems. Hi, uh, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm a first year undergraduate student here at Bristol University. Uh, I study history. I'm 19 years old and I'm from lovely Melbourne in Worcestershire. I'm going to be setting, telling you why I think you, uh, it is right that we have voted to leave. Uh, how we ensure that our immigration system is based on the skills that people can bring to this country and we don't prioritise based upon the colour of their skin or that they happen to be born from an EU country. That we ensure that our laws are passed by British politicians and that the issues that matter to people at Bristol University, things like the nationalisation of industries, things like reducing VAT on tampons, are issues that we can now address now that we have left, left the European Union. Why do you think uh Brexit is such a, has created such a generational divide in our country. Why are young people and students overwhelmingly remain and why are over 65s overwhelmingly leave? I think the way in which Brexit was portrayed in the, um, uh, in the referendum was I think, quite a right-wing uh, thing. And I think if you look at most polling, it suggests that students are on the whole more left-wing. And this has been the case not just this year, but it's been historically the case that students are more left-wing. So I think there's that aspect. Uh, and I also think that students enjoy um, some of the, the best aspects of the EU. So free move, movement in terms of the Erasmus schemes, in terms of, sort of travels to you know, Greece and all these kind of things. So the kind of concrete benefits of European Union membership are really felt by uh, students in a way which perhaps not quite felt so much by my 55 year old dad. And what would you say about that? Well, I think the idea that the Leave campaign was a right wing campaign, the, uh, the Remain campaign was somehow left wing. I mean, the, the leaders of the Remain campaign were David Cameron and George Osborne. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of a very conservative government. But I think what young people, I think um, Rob's right in some respects that yes, we are sort of a bit more um, happy and sort of um, generous and open about the fact that we do in, want to enjoy these opportunities of going abroad and studying and living and working in 27 other countries. We are a bit more sort of optimistic about the opportunities that Europe has, and I don't think we're as, because we're quite young, we're not as nostalgic to this, uh, to this you know, pre-1950s ideal of Britain that um, is sort of golden-eyed um, by over 65s. They, they, you know, they want to harken back to the time when they saw Britain as better, uh, whereas I think a lot of young people who did vote Remain are more looking towards the future and how Britain can be better in the future. Well, you talked about George Osborne and David Cameron. Um, they were, for conservative standards, actually kind of socially liberal on the sort of big society side. Since the vote, we've seen the emergence of the more conservative wing of the Tory party. We've seen Rhys Mogg, we've seen um, Boris, we've seen uh, Michael Gove and so on. Um, do you think that that sort of has legitimised a sort of 
even further right wing discourse among politics? I don't think it's um I don't think politics has necessarily gone extremely right wing. I think it's gone to the extremes. I think you know people do talk about this um this huge gulf that's opened up in the centre ground because you do have on the left Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald, and on the right you've got as you said people like Jacob rees people like um, uh, Priti Patel and uh, David Davis who have this sort of vision of conservativism that I think hasn't been mainstream or popular for, for a lot of years and because there's now such a divide in the country not just generationally but between people who um, have uh, between graduates and non-graduates between uh, north and south between um, you know England and Scotland um, we are in incredibly divided times, and I think that's only, it's only natural births um, reflected in our political uh, sort of atmosphere. Um, since the vote, we've seen a lot of really quite unpleasant discourse in the media um, and on social media and stuff that has targeted um, targeted people on both sides. To be yes. honest. But um, a lot of the headlines have been from the Daily Mail talking about traitors, enemies of the people. Do you think that that is a, a legitimate way to talk about politics today? No. Um, I mean, you can't stop. Newspapers like the Daily Mail from writing headlines like that, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't want to live in a country which did that. But no, it's not a, it's not helpful for public discourse, and it's not appropriate to call judges to enemies of the people or traitors. Um, no, it's not not fair at all. What was your response to all that? Um, well, it just sort of. Um, I think the Daily. I think the sort of the paranoid, um, the paranoid headlines of the Daily Mail are nothing new, um, but they do seem to have been ramped up since the, uh, since the Brexit um, result at any opportunity or any um, possible moment that it looks like Brexit in its purest and most, um, you know, uh, in, in, in its most aggressive form is somehow slipping away. Uh, you know, you saw in when Theresa May decided to go to the country because she didn't feel she had a mandate to um, pursue her particular Brexit. Um, the Daily Mail was urging people to crush the saboteurs, and that's it, it's no way to talk about people, and it's no way to talk about people's politics. So, you know, uh, me and Rob will disagree on this issue vehemently, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure even after this discussion we will do very little to change each other's mind. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, having that conversation, having that open dialogue, and not calling him a racist, and him not calling me a traitor or a quizzling, I think does much better for our country than um, some of the other discourse that we do see. Maybe looking back a bit back to like we're all students, we're all at a university. Um, there's been increasingly a sort of a discourse against the sort of educated elite idea. So Lord Andrew Adonis used, like came out. There was lots of headlines. Him as this like betrayer of Brexit. If you follow AC Grading on Twitter, he does a lot of very anti-Brexit stuff. Do you think that there is a bit of a danger with this liberal intelligentsia, to, like to just distance themselves from the people? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I don't think AC Grayling and Lord Donors speak for the majority of British people. I don't actually think they speak for the majority of the main voters. I think they are on the extremities of the debate. I think they deliberately use quite kind of hyperbolic language to stir up people as kind of provocateurs. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is a disconnect between people, especially living in cities like Bristol and London, who, you know, I have repeatedly met people who, you know, you get on the subject of the referendum and you say, oh, I voted leave. And they'll go, I haven't met a single person who's ever voted leave. If you spend your entire time talking to people who vote the same way as you, as I think we do find in these sort of cities, it's awful. So the ultimate echo chamber. What do you think about this? Yeah, I, th I think there's always a danger that it's self-fulfilling just to talk to your own side. And you do learn a lot more about your own arguments when you engage with people um, who don't have a degree. Or you go to a place... Um, which is just so politically different from your own. I don't like this characterization, yeah, however, yes. that uh, it remains somehow these uh, the sort of the metropolitan elite and leaders of people's uh, people's movement. It, it wasn't a people's movement. It was it was funded by some of the richest um, people in this country. You know, the newspapers that came out massively in favour from it. It was, it was cabal of the Brexit elite of white older men. Uh, some, some of whom who don't even live or pay taxes in this country, but felt it was, for some reason, and you know, uh, for their own reasons, felt it was such an important issue that they had to um, sort of turn the debate toxic. They had to turn this debate into the extremes that it was um, a people's uh, uh, resistance against these elites in the establishment. And the, I, I think that's only typified when you've got Nigel Farage on the day after um, Brexit said, you know, this is, a, this is a victory for the people. And then a week later goes to Donald Trump's uh, Donald Trump's uh, victory celebrations in New York and gets a picture in front of with a billionaire in front of a golden plated elevator. So I, th I think the characterizations of both the campaigns, you know, the levers are 
you know, your, your humble working classes and the remainers of these snobbish middle class people like me. Um, I, th I think it's wrong. I think it, it, it doesn't hold, it doesn't stand up to much scrutiny, and I think it's it's again a part of this agenda to divide to divide us into one group or another and not allow us to have this open dialogue and sort of reason debate. But I think it's probably fair to say that if you look at the days behind behind the referendum, most Remain voters are concentrated in areas such as London and Bristol. So you, I think the word elite is not a good one because uh, yeah. Nigel Farage pretending that he's a man of the people is, is ridiculous. But metropolitan perhaps is a better term generally for people who vote to Remain. Yeah. Not, and not as a particularly negative, yeah, just as, a, as an observation. Oh, if, 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 you, if, you look at, you know, if you look at the map, yeah, yeah, like, yeah I mean, it's, it's, absolutely, right. it's absolutely true to say that in England, not necessarily in, mm. um, in Scotland or Northern Ireland, but certainly in England, the, the pockets that did vote Remain were London, Bristol, Oxford, Liverpool. Yeah. Um, but I also think um, the reason for that has very, actually very little to do with the European Union. I think the referendum wasn't a sort of a, a middle finger to Brussels in as much as it was a middle finger to London, to Westminster, to these people that since 2008 hadn't had a pay rise in almost a decade, who'd been so, felt so left behind by a political um, establishment that was so concerned with GDP and the economy and growing uh, these sort of data and um, figures, but wasn't as concerned with what was actually happening in the ground on people, well, for people whose main concern is, can I pay rent, can I afford uh, my kids' um, school uniform, can I afford to uh, buy food in some cases. But isn't the EU just a larger example of that. Like, a lot of people who voted Leave saw the EU as basically the British government on steroids. It's like this distant Brussels thing that doesn't have any care for, for the people who work in these constituent nations. They, they only care about their wines, their dinners, they, <laughs> they meet in these grand old uh, glass palaces, but they never actually have any contact with real people. A lot of the decisions are made by an un unelected committee. Well, I think, I, I think that goes back to sort of Britain's um, media elite. It goes back to the fact that for the last 40 years, we have had anti- um, EU propaganda being spread all over the front pages, consistently governments of all colours um, have sort of uh, used the EU as an easy blame. So well, I'd love to do this, I'd love to raise this or lower this or make this more free, but I can't do it for the EU. So I think when you add, well, frankly, when you add that plus the 2008 um, financial crisis, which I just, I don't think can be understated in its impact on the vote, you know, I'm, I'm quite surprised that Remain got 48% given all, of, given all of those conditions. Well, one of the great things about leaving is that now if a politician says, oh, I can't do this because of EU regulation, we can go, well, that's just a, you know, you'll be a muppet. Um, and I think in that, actually, genuinely, in that element, it will improve decision making process. Um, I mean, the same is true within Scotland when you know, decisions are passed and the SNP will go, oh, well, we, we would love to do this, but we can't do it because of the British government. It's just sort of one, you know, subsidiary is a, a part of the whole. Um, no, I think leaving the EU will improve decision making precisely because politicians will not be able to say, rightly or wrongly, oh, it's the EU's fault. Well, they might not be able to say that. They, they, they might be able, not be able to blame it on the EU, but I think what we're going to see in sort of the next, if, if Brexit does happen and it happens in the way that um, we it's perceived to be, um, we're not going to have politicians who can do pretty much anything. We're going to lose, um, if you know, the government's own figures are to be believed, we're going to lose a lot of our um, ability to invest in our public services. We're going to lose a lot of our ability to make those decisions because we will be so, particularly I think with the Conservative government that's, I, do, I think now ideologically embedded in this austerity agenda. Uh, coupled with the fact that we are, I think we are going to see a much decrease um, uh, spending ability from the British government. So yes, they might not be able to blame things that they'd like to in the EU, but it doesn't matter because they won't be able to do them anyway because of um, the economic uh, realities. Of yeah, I, mean, I would say in the short run, you're probably correct that we'll, there will be uh, a fall in tax revenues and all these issues. I, I'm, I'm unconvinced about the long-term arguments um, of EU membership in terms of benefits. I think a lot of the government's reports, you know, a lot of the things that we've said that when we would vote to leave the EU, not leave the EU, but vote to leave the EU, there would be economic collapse and all these things, and that, you know, that's not happened. And so I think people are rightfully a little bit sceptical of these reports. Um, but yeah, I think in the short run there will be um, a reduction in, in income. Um, but I just don't think that to many people necessarily increasing tax revenues for the government is the biggest priority of the day. So Rob, hypothetical, um, Brexit is going quite badly, no deal is looking likely, economic forecasts are terrible. Um, That's not hypothetical. Would you want, <laughs> yeah, but if it's looking Jeez. even more realistic, would you deliver Brexit at all costs? 
Uh, yes, uh, I think nothing could do more damage to our country and to the confidence people have in our democratic institutions than to discount the biggest vote that we've ever had. So yeah, I would. Um, for you, yes. uh, same scenario, but okay. a, a, a second referendum or a reversal of Brexit, would that not just undermine, as he said, complete confidence in our democratic institutions? Well, it, it depends how it's done. Uh, if the government were to turn around tomorrow and say, uh, we're actually, we've had to think about it, we're going to stop Brexit, as much as I would like that, I don't think it would have legitimacy. We had a referendum in June, and yes, 16.1 million people voted for Remain, uh, the, uh, more than any uh, winning party at a general election ever, but more people uh, voted Leave, and I respect that. And we're going through these negotiations now, and um, we will see what happens um, on the outset. But I think, to honestly say to people, well, you voted for this at this time, under this prospectus, with, I would say, generously misinformed information, or misleading information, to then say, about two, three years later, well, the circumstances have completely changed. Everything you were promised is not going to happen. Um, the, the sort of misinformed decision we are binding you to forever. That's not, to me, that's not democracy. It, it, democracy, as uh, David Davis once said, um, <laughs> a, a country that <laughs> <country, laughs> cannot change its mind, its mind ceases to be a democracy. James, Rob, thank you so much. Uh, you can have a civilised conversation, if he could, but civilised and polite, <laughs> about Brexit. So, uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time when we'll be discussing something else contained.